when my department chair uh, asked me a year ago if I would represent the Bible Exposition Department in this faculty lecture series, he suggested that I do something on the book of Revelation. He thought that uh, that would be appropriate because on the one hand, Revelation, as Ken said, is uh, a primary area of my academic focus. And on the other hand, Revelation uh, is often avoided by saner people. Uh, and as a result, we don't hear much sane teaching uh, about this book. And so I thought his suggestion was a good idea, and I agreed to do these lectures. Initially, I intended to pick up two passages in the book of Revelation and to work my way through those passages homiletically, but the more I thought about it, the more I realized that in the two half-hour sessions that I have, I would do you a better service to give you a framework for the proper interpretation of Revelation rather than a series of exhortations uh, based in the book. In the end, I've opted to do uh, both things. Today, I'm going to discuss how to interpret the book of Revelation or the elements that are to be uh, born in mind with a proper interpretation of Revelation. And then next Tuesday, I'm going to apply that to a central passage uh, in the book. So let's begin on the methodological side of things. Please turn in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 1 and follow me as I develop some points for a proper interpretation of Revelation from verses 1 to 6. John writes, The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his bondservants the things which must shortly take place. And he sent and communicated it by his angel to his bondservant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of the prophecy and heed the things which are written in it, for the time is near. John, to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and released us from our sins by his blood, and he has made us to be a kingdom, priests to his God and Father, to him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Now, I want you to notice three things communicated in the opening of the book of Revelation. First, Revelation is a letter written by a certain John to seven churches in the Roman province of Asia. We see this in verses 4 and 5. Second, Revelation is a prophetic message that Jesus communicated to John through visions. John says this in verses 1 and 3. And third, the content of the message is summarized in verse 1 in the phrase, the things that must shortly take place. Now, it's important to see these things in the opening of Revelation because each will be essential for a proper interpretation of the book. So in the rest of this morning's talk, I'm going to take up each of these things in turn and discuss their significance for understanding Revelation. So first, let's unpack the idea that Revelation is a letter to seven churches of to the seven churches of Asia. Take a look again at verses uh, four and five. It says, "John to the seven churches of Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who is to come uh, and who was and who is to come." That is from God the Father, and from the seven spirits who are before His throne that is, from the Holy Spirit, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. Now, this language, you probably recognize, uh, author to recipients, greetings, this identifies Revelation as a letter. 
This was the typical way to begin a letter in the first century uh, Mediterranean world. So think about how Paul begins his letters, right? Um, 2 Corinthians, for example, begins, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the church of God in Corinth, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Author to recipients, greetings. In the case of the book of Revelation, it, the letter is from someone named John, probably John the Apostle. And it's written to seven churches in the Roman province of Asia. Asia is at the west end of what is today the modern country of Turkey. Now, why is it important to recognize that Revelation is first and foremost a letter? It's because of what goes into the expectations for letters. When we write a letter, we write about things that we think will be relevant to uh, the person that we're writing to, either informing them uh, about something or addressing some situation that they're experiencing. And the same thing is true for letters in the New Testament. They are written to real churches with real issues that the author wanted to address. As such, a proper interpretation or a proper hermeneutics demands that we understand Revelation as intended to address something related to the concerns of the churches to whom John writes. That is, something related to the social situation of Christians in first century Roman Asia. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean that Revelation has to be about the seven churches, but it does mean that the readers in those churches were expected to be able to understand the message of Revelation and to see its relevance for how they were to respond to their historical situation. And in fact, that situation is not difficult to discern. Chapters two and three of Revelation, the so-called letters to the seven churches, uh, are especially helpful in reconstructing the social situation of John's churches. From those chapters, we learned that the Christian communities of Asia were ex experiencing extreme pressures to compromise their faithfulness to Christ. This took on two forms. On the one hand, opposition from the larger pagan culture, probably due to Christian refusal to participate in rituals honoring the gods, opposition from the larger culture had already resulted in at least one martyrdom in the city of Pergamum. Furthermore, the Jewish community, especially in Pergamum and Philadelphia, had fanned the flames of this opposition by denying the validity of Christian claims to be following the Jewish Messiah. And if the Jews were making these claims before the civic or imperial authorities, they were paving the way to have Christianity declared an illegal religion by the Romans and thus to expose Christians to government persecution. This is especially meaningful in view of the strength of the Roman imperial cult in Asia generally and in the cities uh, of John's churches particularly. Sponsorship of the cult of the emperors was an extremely important civic honor at the time John was writing. And the cities of Ephesus and Smyrna and Pergamum were especially jealous of this honor. The presence of the imperial cult and its connection to civic honor would have exerted tremendous social pressure on the churches in these cities, particularly given Jewish efforts to de delegitimize the church before the Romans as a form of Judaism. So in view of this precarious social situation, the churches faced a second threat theological pressures from inside their own ranks to compromise with the surrounding culture. False teachers had arisen in Ephesus, Pergamum, and Thyatira, recommending behavior that would be less antagonistic to the pagan society. In Laodicea, although they were apparently spared this false teaching, the Christian community 
had become complacent in their witness, enjoying an easy truce with the culture. So this is the basic situation that John is going to address in the book of Revelation, one in which Christians as a culturally marginalized minority are being challenged to maintain their commitment to Christ. There's a further element that uh, I haven't addressed yet. I'll pick it up toward the end, but this is the basic situation. Now, the second thing I want us to notice uh, in Revelation 1, 4 to 6 is that Revelation is a prophetic message communicated to John through visions. Okay, so take a look again at verses 1 to 3. The revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave him, gave Jesus, to show to his bondservants the things that must shortly take place. And this he did, communicating it to his bondservant John, who bore witness to the word of God and the testimony of Jesus, even to all that he saw. Blessed is the one who reads and those who hear the words of the prophecy and heed the things written in it, for the time is near. So John says, that he saw some things, some visions, and that what he saw constituted a prophetic message from Jesus. Now this brings up a second important point for our interpretation of Revelation. Though Revelation is a letter, it's a very strange letter. The body of this letter is in uh, the the form of a series of very bizarre vision reports, visions that make most modern Christians uh, scratch their heads when they read it. Okay? But John's readers would not have been confused by this letter. When they read it, they would have recognized a form of literature that they were familiar with, a genre that we call apocalypse. This is something that's totally foreign to our own culture, but uh, was relatively common in the Jewish Christian culture at the time John is writing. Now, before I develop this point a little further, I need to make uh, sort of a crucial detour here. Many people, when they read the book of Revelation, uh, they read it as if John saw a videotape of future events, okay? Um, And John is kind of scrambling to record his experience before he forgot it. And since John is watching, for example, future warfare, he had no concept of what things like tanks or helicopters are. And so uh, he's just using the language and the images at his disposal in order to try to get down what it is he's watching. Okay, But that is not how Revelation was written. It's very clear... Uh, when you read the book uh, carefully, that John is very intentional uh, in creating the message that he's trying to to get across. The literary features of Revelation, including not only its language, but its structure, and in this case, as we're going to develop, its genre as well, were intentionally chosen by John to help communicate to his churches the significance of the visions that he saw. John saw some visions, and what he saw in the visions is what he records, but he has shaped the telling of what he saw in order to communicate the significance to his audience. Okay, so for our purposes right now, we need to understand that the genre of Revelation, the main part of Revelation, or the main part of this book, was a relatively common first century Judeo-Christian genre, and it was intentionally chosen by John to communicate his visions to his churches. So what is an apocalypse, or what expectations for interpretation were raised by using the genre apocalypse? Apocalypses are narratives of visions that someone saw about how God was going to judge his enemies and vindicate his saints and establish his kingdom on earth. The visions are always highly symbolic. 
In other words, they aren't literal presentations of the actual future events, but symbolic dreams of future persons and events. So when John's readers read the apocalyptic portion of his book, they didn't think that the things they were reading about were really going to look like how John depicted them. Okay? They understood that those depictions were symbols for certain realities, not the realities themselves. For example, none of John's readers would have thought that just because John saw, uh, describes a vision of Christ as a slain lamb with seven horns and seven eyes, that that's what Jesus really looks like. Okay? I hope none of you think that either, right? That was a symbol for the significance of Jesus in his death and resurrection, not the reality of Jesus' resurrection body. And I don't think any of us would find that shocking. The point is, when we read Revelation, we have to keep its symbolic nature in mind. We have to expect that what we're reading is a symbol for something else, not the literal thing itself, unless there's some very clear indication in the text that John intends us to understand it otherwise. Now, remember I said that Revelation is a letter. Revelation must not only have been relevant to John's churches, but I said it also had to have been understandable to John's churches. Okay? This is especially true for the symbolism of Revelation. The symbolism must be you know what, this is kind of a bummer because I can't even read what I'm looking at on my computer. Oh, nor can I read what's in the back of the room. Okay, uh, so I have to turn around and just make sure that uh, what's, what I think is gonna be up there is really up there. Um, yeah, it was a long time ago that I met my wife at Biola. Uh, okay, so the symbolism has to be symbolism that's accessible to John's readers. John's trying to communicate to first century Christians. Okay? Uh, it's not symbolism that only modern Americans could understand. So a bear might represent Persia, since that's a symbol that John's readers could have found in the book of Daniel, but it wouldn't represent Russia. Okay? Or an eagle might represent the Roman Empire, since that was a symbol for Imperial Rome current in John's day, but it would not represent the United States. Okay? In other words, the, meanings, the meaning of the symbols in Revelation can only come from sources familiar to first century Christians, and really only three sources. First, the symbols could come from just general observations about the created world. For example, in Revelation 6, John sees someone riding a green horse, and the name of the rider is Death. Now, why would Death be portrayed as riding a green horse, or perhaps a sickly grayish green horse? Well, it's because that's the color that bodies become a short time after dying. It's not an exactly appetizing picture, but it's something that John's readers would have been familiar with. A second source for the symbolism in Revelation is the Mediterranean cultures in which John's readers lived. For example, in Revelation 17, John sees this gaudy prostitute riding on a seven-headed beast. And in verse 9 of that chapter, the identity of the prostitute is explained to John. An angel tells John, here is the mind that has wisdom. The seven heads are seven hills on which the woman sits. And if you drop down to verse 18 in Revelation 17, it says, the woman that you saw is the great city that reigns over the kings of the earth. Now, first off, for John's readers, the great city that reigns over the kings of the earth could be none other than the city of Rome, the seat of the Roman Empire. But John's readers 
would also be familiar with the image of a woman sitting on seven hills as a symbol for the goddess Roma, the goddess who personifies the city of Rome. So, this is a picture of a Roman coin uh, in use in John's day in the province of Asia. It shows the goddess Roma sitting on the seven hills of Rome, and you can see her name is uh, at the bottom. And to your left, uh, there's a picture of Romulus and Remus, the founders of the city of Rome, suckling at the she-wolf from the mythology for that. And on the right-hand side is the river god Tiber, representing the river of Rome uh, flowing in front of Roma. Now this kind of iconography would not only have appeared on coins, but on public buildings as well. And John's readers would have encountered it daily. So it's symbolism that they would recognize immediately. And we only have to look at their culture in order to understand it. John is writing about the city of Rome in this instance. The final place that the symbols for in Revelation uh, could come from is the scriptures with which John's readers were familiar. Certainly the Old Testament and perhaps elements of the New Testament, at the very least, the synoptic tradition. In fact, this is probably the most common source of symbolism in Revelation. When you read the book of Revelation, you have to read it with your Old Testament open. Okay? So, for example, turn to Revelation 13. Here John describes uh, for the first time the beast that we just talked about in Revelation 17, the beast that the prostitute was writing on. And take a look at verses 1 and 2. John says, And I saw a beast coming out of the sea, having ten horns and seven heads, and on his horns were ten diadems, and on his heads were blasphemous names. And the beast that I saw was like a leopard, and his feet were like those of a bear, and his mouth was like the mouth of a lion. This description is intended to recall, uh, for John's readers, Daniel chapter 7. In Daniel 7, Daniel saw a succession of four beasts in a dream. A lion, a bear, a leopard, and then this ten-horned blasphemous beast. And he's told in Daniel 7 that these beasts represent a succession of empires that would dominate Israel and that would culminate in a final persecuting king. So the beast in Revelation 13 is made up of all four beasts of Daniel chapter 7. It either represents the succession of empires or it represents the culmination of those empires in the final persecutor. And the interpretation right now is not uh, super important for us. What we want to see here is that the symbolism is informed by the Old Testament. That is, it's symbolism that John expected his readers to recognize from the scriptures they had available to them. Okay, so I said there are three things that I wanted us to notice in the opening of Revelation that have to uh, do with our interpretation of the book. First, Revelation is a letter. And as such, the interpretation of Revelation has to be something relevant to and accessible to John's original audience. Second, Revelation is an apocalypse, a prophetic vision of the end. As such, it communicates via symbolism. And the symbolism must have been understandable by John's audience. The third thing I want us to see in Revelation 1, uh, 1 to 6 is what John says the revelation is about. So take a look again at Revelation 1, 1. John says, The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his bondservants the things that must shortly take place. Notice that revelation 
is about the things that must shortly take place. In fact, this is a phrase that's used four times in the book of Revelation. Uh, it occurs at each of the major structural transitions in the book, and it's used in each of those places to summarize the message of the book. Okay, so this is clearly uh, John's circumlocution for uh, what he wants to talk about in the book of Revelation. Okay, now, this is also the first piece of symbolism that we encounter in the book. This is a phrase that comes from the Old Testament, and it stands for a set of ideas found uh, in, the, in the passage. To be precise, the phrase is an allusion to Daniel 2, 29, and 45. In Daniel 2, oh gosh, in Daniel 2, uh, Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, has a dream of a great statue made of four kinds of metal. And a stone falls from heaven and strikes the statue on its feet, toppling the statue and crushing it. The stone then grows into a mountain that covers the earth. And Daniel is brought in to interpret uh, this dream. And he tells Nebuchadnezzar that the God of heaven has given him this dream to make known the things that must take place after these things. That's the basic phrase that John uses in Revelation. Daniel then interprets the dream as predicting the succession of the four Israel-dominating empires, beginning with Babylon, and that in the days of the fourth empire, the eternal kingdom of God would supplant all the others and would itself never be destroyed. He then again summarizes the contents of the dream in verse 45 as the things that must take place after these things. The allusion to Daniel 2, 29 and 45 then in Revelation 1 is an allusion to the dream of Nebuchadnezzar as the basic contents of the book of Revelation. However, Daniel 2 in the book of Daniel forms the basic framework for a larger eschatology that he develops. And John, throughout Revelation, refers to other passages in Daniel that makes it clear John is not just interested in the dream of Daniel chapter 2, but he's interested in the more developed eschatology of the book of Daniel. So, in other words, Revelation is fundamentally about the Danielic eschatology. So to interpret Revelation properly, uh-oh, looks like I'm somewhere behind things here. Um, so to interpret Revelation properly, we need to know a little bit about the eschatology in Daniel, at least as it's utilized by John. There's a lot of controversy about the eschatology of Daniel, but we can see how John develops that. So as Daniel develops the themes of uh, Daniel chapter 2, he anticipates not just a succession of Israel dominating empires that are ultimately supplanted by the kingdom of God. He also uh, understands there to be a series of typologically related persecuting emperors that culminates in a final persecuting king, someone that we call Antichrist. And that king is destroyed at the coming of one like a son of man, the eternal king in the eternal kingdom of God. In particular, Daniel warns his readers of the upcoming persecution of the Jews, that is, for Daniel's readers, a future persecution of the Jews, by the Macedonian king Antiochus IV as a type of the final persecutor. He also gives them hope that faithfulness to God would ultimately, ultimately be rewarded in the kingdom of God. And that's the eschatology that John wants to apply to his churches. So notice the time indicator in the phrase of Daniel. The things that must take place 
after these things. Uh, or in Daniel 2.28, in that same passage, it also says, the things that must take place in the latter days. But John has changed the time indicator in this opening phrase in Revelation. He says, Revelation is about the things that must take place soon, or the things that must take place shortly. This implies that John expects the Danielic eschatology to have some application in the near future of the churches to which he's writing. This is stated in verse 3 as well. Blessed are the ones uh, who pay attention because the time is near. Similar statements are made later in the book. This first century application of the eschatology of Daniel in the book of Revelation is corroborated in various ways, but especially for, for today, I'll just make the point, um, in the connection between the prophetic announcement in Revelation 1-7 and the uh, letters to the seven churches in Revelation 2-3. to So in Revelation 1-7, um, the primary theme of the book of Revelation is announced. We have this statement. Behold, he is coming on the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn for him. This is, in part, an allusion to Daniel 7.13, and probably also to uh, the Jesus tradition in the synoptics, and the coming of the one like a son of man to receive eternal dominion in the kingdom of God. As such, Revelation is about the culmination of the Danielic eschatology in the second coming of Christ. It is about the end of history. Okay? Revelation is a message about the, the end of history in the second coming of Christ. However, the oracles to the seven churches in Revelation 2 and 3, and which are spoken by one like a son of man, Daniel, uh, John identifies Jesus in Revelation 1.13, these messages also include the repeated statement, I am coming, or I am coming quickly, some variation of that. And there, in those chapters, the coming of Christ is related or is a warning of some impending first century visitation of Jesus upon John's churches, a visitation in which the strength of their commitment to Christ will be tested. And the means of this testing in those letters is stated in Dan Danielic terms as a period of tribulation, a period of severe persecution uh, by the imperial authorities. And this is later developed in Revelation 13 and the beast, and we don't have time to look at that. In effect, just as Daniel used the eschatological tribulation of God's people and their vindication in the kingdom of God to inform an upcoming persecution of his Jewish readers, John is using that eschatology to inform an upcoming persecution of his readers. It's as if he takes the lens of the end times and uses that to view the situation of his churches and what they're going to experience. Thus, a proper interpretation of Revelation will not have as its sole focus the end of the age, the final tribulation, uh, the testing of the saints, the second coming of Christ to establish the eternal kingdom of God. It must also include a focus on the first century, on its concerns, on its symbols, on its experience of the Danielic eschatology. And because this typological eschatology of Daniel allows for numerous manifestations of anti-Christian persecution of the people of God, what John says to his churches 
He says, to all churches, resist the pressure to compromise, stay faithful to Jesus, you will inherit the kingdom in the end. Now, today I've covered uh, a lot of purely theoretical stuff. Next week, I'll bring this down to earth a little bit in a more uh, homiletical style and a more explicit application. But let me just encourage you not to be afraid of the book of Revelation. It is first and foremost a book of tremendous hope for believers, and it deserves to be cherished by all of us. So take some time this read this week to read the book of Revelation. As uh, Ken said, echoing John, you'll be blessed. You'll receive a blessing for doing so. So um, there are other elements uh, of Revelation that we can't get into that make it uh, a little bit more complicated than what I just talked about. But for the most part, um, please remember when you're reading this book, it's a book that in, that's intended to address the concerns of Christians uh, marginalized in the world. And um, if you read it uh, with an eye toward um, your vindication in Christ, um, you'll receive a blessing. Biola University prepares Christians to think biblically about everything from science to business to education and the arts. Learn more at biola.edu.